Guns make you nervous. There's just something you have to understand about Charles Bronson and Death Wish 5. This motherfucker is old! The first Death Wish was filmed when Charles Bronson was 50 fucking 3, and this movie came two full decades the fuck later. This cat was on a first name basis with Hammurabi. How can I too age like Charles fucking Bronson, you inquire? Watch and fucking learn, young grasshopper. Death Wish 5 boasts perhaps the most brief opening the titty window in contemporary cinema. I've seen porn more reticent to flash the female breast. You're literally inundated with a deluge of nipular fortitude a full minute before you catch your first glimpse of Bronson himself, who has incidentally returned to New York City for the third fucking time, presumably to aid in the cleanup of the Brooklyn-sized fucking crater left in the wake of Death Wish fucking 3. Because he's fucking Bronson, he is once again nailing a woman who is younger than literally anything in his gun cabinet. And before you press for her name or occupation, a fashion designer for the record, permit me to remind you that this woman is tertiarily involved with Paul Kersey. She's beyond doom. This woman is a skeleton with a British accent, Rageaholics. Perhaps in an effort to make her demise even more imminent, before she upgraded to Bronson, Dixie Carter over here used to be married to one of the most powerful mobsters on the East Coast, played with aplomb by We're Terribly Sorry We Couldn't Afford Jack Nicholson. And just in case the Sword of Damocles weren't hovering quite precariously enough, she decides she's in the mood to rat him out to the FBI. You see, he's evidently a silent partner in Dixie Carter's budding empire of bad wigs and fetish apparel for the purposes of money laundering, which he wants her to do more of while making less clove- Look, if this shit sounds vague, confusing, or counterintuitive, it's only because it will never again be referred to for the duration of this motherfucking film. But her employees, it appears, prefer to take orders from a banging milf rather than Jack Nicholson's value model. You know what your problem is? What? You and your boss think you don't have to service your partners anymore. This company is too fat, and you- you ought to do that. I think you ought to have Dr. O'Shea's one oh, second oh. weight loss. Oh, no! Don't do that. Okay, huh? Don't you? What don't you? Ah! But when Carl Winslow over here takes exception to the sweatshop workers' treatment, the rapid encroachment of political correctness in post-2000 cinema comes into laser-sharp focus. That's bullshit! What's that? Bullshit. What's that, man? So are you! Yeah, man, I make you the head, nigga, and you talk to me like that? Fuck you, son! Hey! Reg, you got a big mouth. Now apologize to the man. I say shit! Oh, now, Reggie, you know damn well if you don't say shit, you'll lose 90% of your vocabulary. You people just never learn, do you? Ah! There you go, Sambo. Of course, carving up Jim Sterling and muttering racially charged epithets works up a wicked appetite, and it isn't long before O'Shea is in the mood for some Gunga dinner. I bet it's beautiful. Oh, it is. I can't tell you what this means to me and Chelsea. She so needs a father. Can I take that to mean a yes? With all my heart. Dixie darts off to the ladies' room to scrub the 90s off her frock, and if you've ever nourished the hope that I would utter the phrase dermatitis-afflicted transvestite assassin in a video, first off, what the fuck is wrong with you? And second, happy fucking Kwanzaa, Rageaholics. <laughs> Look at that beautiful face! Take a good look at it. Because I'm gonna have to take it away from you! It's best to be careful who you talk to. Well, that's certainly a thing that happened, but not nearly as spine-chillingly goddamn terrifying as what we are all about to fucking witness. Even with reconstruction, the face will never be the same. You got a problem? Guns make you nervous. Guns have their uses. Idiots with guns make me nervous. God damn it, and they just rebuilt New York, too. But when Carl Winslow falls prey to a gaggle of hired goons, Jim Sterling can withstand no more. He sings to the police, which ends about as well as you would expect in a movie called fucking Death Wish.
Unfortunately, Detective Chun Li over here confuses the runaway car's fender with Manchuria and falls prey to the single most vicious drilling of an Asian woman that wasn't hand animated. <laughs> In the aftermath, Bronson has a heart-to-heart -heart with Chun-Li's partner and chokes down a healthy dose of fully engorged police incompetence. You're not thinking of going back to your old ways, are you? Is that such a bad idea? You know, sometimes the law works. And sometimes it doesn't. Tell me something. How long have you been trying to take these guys down? Sixteen years. Sixteen years? Well, it's a long time to be failing. Oh, that never stopped Sony. <laughs> Recovering from being turned into fucking Jigsaw, Bronson's gal pal decides the wisest course of action is to loudly declare her intention to speak to the FBI. Wendy O. Williams wasn't this determined to fucking die. <laughs> Promise me if anything should happen to me. Nothing's gonna happen. Promise me still. You'll take care of Chelsea. Of course, I promise. I love you. And I love you. Hello. I'm coming for you. Yes? Dwight McDonald, Justice Department. A mere mortal might have opened the door for the transparent shotgun-toting imposters, but Charles Bronson's mustache senses tingling. Who is it? Goons. Who? Hired goons. Hired goons? You might think this would touch off a bitchin' apartment showdown with Bronson snapping every Guido in New York in fucking half. You would, however, be forgetting that this movie is from 1994, which means it's half past time to hold on to your dicks and brace for gratuitous 90s slow mo. There he is! <laughs> fucking thanks, John Woo! You've officially filmed a 74 year old man in slow motion. What's next? Filming a glacier in bullet time? Of course, our gallant tranny assassin from the opening act corners Dixie on the roof, and there is nothing fucking glacial about the rate at which she plummets to her middle aged demise. <laughs> Before he can generate any life-giving tears, the goons cut Kersey off of the pass, but if you believe he's in any real danger, you would be fucking mistaken. Bronson, you see, is Lord King of the Moon. And like his lunar domain, he is comprised of many phases. From Paul Kersey, mild-mannered pacifist architect, to the original Agent 47, to rocket launcher toting urban fucking Rambo, but Charles Bronson is about to remind us all that even in his mid-70s, he is still the original fucking Batman. <laughs> With a metamorphosis from mustachioed mediator to cape crusader now complete, Bronson heads out for a light meal. A fucking revenge! Where's Mama? She's in the back. all work, you see. Bronson always has time for low-impact sporting activity, and what better candidate than the most popular sport in the world? Hmm. Birthday present? A treat for someone special. How lovely. Won't they be surprised? Now to me, now to me, that's nuts, that's nuts. Now to me, sign them all, now to me. The catch? We're playing Death Wish rules. No hands, no feet, no skull, and watch for falling one-liners. Hey, Freddy, I'm gonna take care of your dandruff problem for you. <laughs> 
For those filling out scorecards at home, that makes two of four shitbags taken behind the goddamn murder shed. We're terribly sorry we couldn't afford Jack Nicholson ain't taking it lying down, however, and sets a heavily armed, heavily middle-aged trap in a room filled with enough naked plastic bitches to be mistaken for the cast of Soul Calibur VI. But what item in his fearsome arsenal will Bronson employ? His gun? His mustache? His perpetually confused Alzheimer's gaze? Ah, but you've already forgotten Bronson's table of elements. Fire, water, wind, and fucking surprise! aloud why is there an electrified fence indoors in a fucking mannequin factory? You're already taking this film far more seriously than its director. With only himself and a six-shooter standing between Bronson and Hack Nicholson, the mob's enforcer heads it on down to the obligatory murder factory. And move the fuck over, Electroshock douchebag, because the award for most creative demise in a Death Wish film has officially been fucking usurped. I have no gun. Hey. Eh? You wouldn't shoot another man, would you? Would you? Percy? <laughs> how chorizo is made. But Paul Kersey isn't here for dyspepsia-inducing Mexican cuisine. Armed with a bitchin' shotgun and with O'Shea on the ropes, he beats his candy ass and shanks him one for the sake of poetic justice. But where antagonist deaths are concerned, how a nebulous fuck does one top the chorizo grinder machine of doom? What is bada-bing? Oh, we're terribly sorry, but all signs point to Charles Bronson mulching this mouthy leprechaun in a vat of motherfucking acid! Whatever you need. I don't need anything. But you... You need a bath. Wish 5 the worst of the series? Uh, probably. But the worst Bronson film still curb checks the lily livered fuck out of Jason Statham's entire filmography. It lacks the lunacy of Death Wish 3 and falls short of the pathos of Death Wish 1 and 2, but between the slow brooding Bill de Bronson and easily one of the most magnetic antagonists in the history of action films, Death Wish 5 The Face of Death is far from devoid of its own unique merits. I'm Razor Fist. Ima, how's about a Death Wish 6? No dice. This ain't over. <laughs>